Ah, the Wii U, what a sad story. After the highest of highs Nintendo experienced with the Wii, the Wii U brought them down to the lowest of lows. This is John Zakari, and today, as the life of the Wii U comes closer to its end, I want to discuss the major missteps that led to it being such a disaster. These are five reasons the Wii U failed. Let's start with what has been one of the longest standing arguments against Nintendo systems. Power. And I'm going to slip system architecture in here as well. Now, before the fanboys pull out their pitchforks, yes, I agree. The games are the most important aspect of any system. But that doesn't change the fact that power still matters. Simply, a system's power allows games to not only look and perform better, but it allows for more complex game design. I mean, just look at systems generationally. Think of your favorite game of all time. Now, send it back to the previous generation. I imagine that game would look a lot different. Nintendo has long decided that they don't want to get caught up in the race for who has the most powerful console. And while that's understandable, it has set them back a ways. The Wii U was the first Nintendo system to support HD. And while it was cool to finally see Nintendo characters at high resolutions, we had already been playing games in HD on other systems for years at that point, so the wow factor was kind of gone. And not long after the release of the Wii U, the PS4 and Xbox One were released, allowing for much more expansive and detailed games. This leap also led third-party developers to focus on developing games for those systems, leaving the Wii U largely behind as a lot of work would need to go into bringing their games over to the system because of its lower power potential and difficult to develop for architecture. Oh boy, the game droughts. Please, Nintendo. Never again. Once third-party support for the system dropped off a cliff, it was mostly up to Nintendo to support the Wii U on their own, I will say the Nintendo games were consistently of high quality. We're talking 8s and 9s out of 10 almost across the board. But there was so much time in between releases. We're talking sometimes months, yes, months plural, between singular major releases. Which is kind of nuts when you think about it. Besides the time between releases, it's important to note the lack of options. This is a point I often find myself debating with fanboys who like to peddle the logic of, oh well, you have X game coming out and that can hold you over until the Y game releases. It's like, okay, but what if I don't want the Y game? Then I'm waiting even longer until game, I guess, Z. On the other systems, you usually have several major games releasing every month. So you have options. Maybe you're looking for a shooter or an action game. You can probably find something on the horizon. For the longest time with the Wii U, it was like, well, I hope you're ready for this game because that's all that's coming out for the next few months. Wait, the gamepad? This is the thing that separated the Wii U from the other consoles. Like, dude, off-screen play. Arguably the Wii U's greatest feature. I concur, but... I think if I look objectively at the gamepad in terms of what it actually did for the success of the Wii U, I think it hurt the console more than it helped. I made a previous video centered solely around the gamepad, so if you want my full thoughts on that, I'll link to it at the end. But being different has its consequences. It added to the difficult coding process, harkening back to my architecture point, that third parties just didn't want to deal with. I mean, when you're selling a small percentage of your total game sales for one particular system, and it requires more work to port to that system than the others that are more profitable, do you really even want to bother with it? I maintain that this is a major reason, along with the obvious low sales, that drove third parties away from the system. And Nintendo themselves even seemed to push it to the side as time went on. Few games in the latter years of the system's life were centered around the gamepad. 
More often, games just offered a few bonus features while using the gamepad. I think if the Wii U shipped with just a Pro Controller, which would have slashed the price of the system, it would have done better. If you've followed me for a while now, you know that the Wii U's internet service has always been one of my biggest issues with the system. There were so many games that didn't have any online multiplayer functions that could have greatly benefited from them, and many of the ones that did, didn't do so very well. Like seriously, when am I going to be able to do 4 man lag free battles in Smash Brothers Online? Hopefully before I'm dead. Thankfully with Splatoon being the big breakout hit for the system, Nintendo will offer some higher quality online for the Switch. They certainly better if they expect me to pay for it. Still, internet has never been Nintendo's strong suit. So does this really need to be on the list? More so, number two on the list? Well, first off, I never said this list is in any particular order, so shut up. But either way, yes, it does, because I'm bundling into this section the f***ing virtual console. Holy shit, Nintendo, within two months of the NES Classic Edition being released, people have cracked it and loaded it up with tons more games. And not only until a few weeks ago were you able to port Star Fox 64 to the Wii U eShop. I'm sorry, there's just no excuse for this. Nintendo, you better fix that garbage this time around with the Switch. And oh yeah, give us a way to link our old accounts to this system so we don't have to rebuy these games again. I'm simply tired of buying Super Metroid like every four years. So, you want to Wii U this holiday? Yeah, we want. Finally, of course, there's the big one. The reason the Wii U was practically sentenced to death before it even hit store shelves. The marketing. From day one, the initial reveal of the system, people were perplexed about what the hell Nintendo was trying to sell them. I mean, professionals in the gaming industry needed to reach out to Nintendo to confirm that the Wii U was in fact a new system and not just a peripheral for the Wii. This confusion was largely caused by the name. Ugh, the Wii U. I'm sure it's going to haunt Nintendo executives for a long time that they went with that as the name, and it's their fault too, as they greedily aimed to capitalize on the success of the Wii and ended up shooting themselves in the foot instead. On top of that, once the Wii U did release, the marketing campaign was poor throughout the system's entire life. I mean, how many commercials chock full of annoying little kids do you really need? What a turnoff for your average consumer, and said kids were usually the focal point, with the actual games taking a back seat, often playing in the background or something. Nintendo, haters already refer to you as the kitty console. Why give them more ammo? Essentially, a rebranding of the system, hyper-focused on the amazing first-party titles, was something the Wii U needed from the start. Nintendo should have recognized this from the first reveal and acted accordingly. Instead, they brashly stood on their mountain of money made by the Wii, assuming they could do no wrong, and they paid for it. As the saying goes, those who don't learn history are doomed to repeat it. And I hoped that the Wii U was a harsh lesson for Nintendo, and will force them to make significant strides to not make the same mistakes in the future. I've said I never want to see Nintendo go third party, and I sure as hell never want them to have another Wii U situation. With that, this video is a wrap. Let me know where you think Nintendo went wrong with the Wii U in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, subscribe to my channel now, and you can say you were a subscriber before it was cool. As always, I'm John Zakari, and thanks for watching.